The Henry Adams curve is basically the idea that energy consumption is going to grow by 7% every year, and for over 200 years this growth remained true until it suddenly stopped in the 70s. And actual energy consumption has been flat ever since, in spite of population growth. Today we are behind the curve by a factor of 30, which means that getting back on track is going to require an increase in energy consumption of 30 times, so not 30%, but 30 times, which seems fairly impossible. But some people see hope. Today we have wind and solar, and these technologies are the cheapest sources of energy in human history. Nothing is cheaper, and solar in particular is on an impressive declining cost curve. And economics teaches us that when the cost declines, the consumption increases, so just putting these two things together, it would seem natural to expect that the energy consumption curve is just about to inflect upwards, thanks to wind and solar, but I disagree. In fact, I believe that this curve, when measured correctly, is actually just about to inflect downwards. Cheaper energy and less consumption. And look, I'm not saying that it's never going to go up again. In fact, in the very long term, I do see some scenarios where we may even meet the Henry Adams line again, like way, way into the future. But for now, and for the next few decades, I believe that this curve will have way further to fall before it starts going up again. So hello YouTube, I'm Michael Size, and here's why. First of all, it's actually the solar panels themselves. As a first order effect, solar panels actually decrease energy consumption before we even talk about how you're using the electricity. The solar panels reduce energy consumption and that's because they eliminate the rejected heat. Now, if you clicked on a video about the Henry Adams curve, you probably know the difference between power, energy, heat and temperature, but if you don't, just know that all of these are separate concepts, although related, and I'll be making an effort to be thorough and consistent in how I use these words, and hopefully you can catch their meaning along the way, because explaining them would take too long. But really think about how a power plant works. For every 10 kilowatt hour of heat that a power plant produces by burning the fossil fuel, a coal power plant will reject at least 6.5 kilowatt hours of it into the atmosphere, while only delivering about 3.5 kilowatt hours of it as electrical energy. And this is about the same ratio as for a nuclear power plant. An oil power plant will reject about 6 to 6 6.5 kilowatt hours and a gas power plant will reject about 4 to 6.5 kilowatt hours depending on whether it's a simple cycle power plant or a combined cycle power plant. And I do think it's kind of surreal to look at one of these flue pipes on a power plant and realize that there could be entire gigawatts of heat being released out of every one of them. Especially in something like a simple cycle gas power plant where there's no steam turbine. But with wind and solar, all of that wasted heat goes away and you just get the electricity. This is a very powerful effect, I mean literally more energy gets wasted in a thermal power plant than gets delivered as electricity. So renewables actually save more power than they make even before you talk about how that power is being used, but people really don't seem to be aware of this. And the reason why people aren't aware is because they don't want you to know about it. Let me explain. When you look at most energy consumption charts, they actually use something called the substitution method, which means that when you generate 1 kilowatt hour of electricity from solar, they actually record it as 2.5 kilowatt hours of energy, and I guess that the reason for this is they try to make the chart more representative of actual energy consumption, but I will argue that if anything, this makes the chart even less representative. And I know that this is a very very nerdy thing to argue about, but hear me out. Imagine you have a gas power plant next to a city, and the gas power plant burns 3 gigawatt hours of gas per day, delivering 1 gigawatt hour of electricity and rejecting 2 gigawatt hours of heat to the atmosphere. 
Meanwhile, in the city, every household has their own water heaters, and in total, the city burns many, many gigawatt hours of gas per day to make their domestic hot water. Well, now imagine that you replace the power plant with solar and batteries, so now the 2 gigawatt hours you rejected is gone. At this point, are you going to record that 1 gigawatt hour of solar energy as 3 gigawatt hours? Would that be more accurate? Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, so far it's actually difficult to tell what the correct decision may be. But now imagine this scenario. You keep the gas power plant in place, but you set up a cogeneration system. And you pair this with a district hot water network. So what this means is that you take the exhaust from the power plant, which is still hot, and instead of just dumping it into the atmosphere, you actually use it to heat up water in a boiler, and you sell that hot water to the city directly via the district network, so now the people don't have to run their water heaters as much. This heat recovery system at the power plant is about as efficient as a home boiler, so recovering the heat from that 2 gigawatt hour that used to be rejected will cause the city to burn right around 2 gigawatt hours per day less gas. This is the exact same energy equation as the previous scenario. You decrease the primary energy by 2 gigawatt hours per day in both of these scenarios, but if you're trying to answer the question this time, are you going to multiply the electrical output of the power plant by 3 when you're recording it? I mean, quite obviously not. What you're gonna do is you'll just continue to take the readings from the company that's selling the gas and that goes into the chart. So if you're not going to multiply it in this scenario, it makes no sense to multiply it in the previous scenario either, because both of them simply get rid of the same wasted energy. So to recap everything so far, we've seen that switching our current electricity demand to wind water solar is going to cut the associated primary energy demand by two thirds, as a result of eliminating the waste heat. But remember that net zero means electrify everything and decarbonize electricity, so this is actually only step two. As it turns out, step 2 is actually happening a lot faster, which means that we're decarbonizing electricity way faster than we're coming up with new electricity demand from electrification. So going forward, all new electrification is going to be supplied by wind water solar. And with this in mind, we have two elephants in the room of electrification, and these are road transport and low temperature heat. And if you thought that decarbonization was a big deal, well these ones are absolutely going to blow your mind, starting off with road transport. And the short version here goes like this. The battery in a Tesla car holds about as much energy as 2 gallons of gasoline and the car can travel 300 miles on that. When the government says that these cars get 150 miles per gallon equivalent, that isn't propaganda. Those are the actual numbers and this is actually why we consider electric cars to be a done deal. They just save money. I know there's a lot of misinformation about electric cars out there and I can't fight all of it in every video I make, but the fact is that the Teslas of today are high quality, high performance, same sticker price as combustion competitors, higher reliability, lower repair cost, lower maintenance cost, and way lower energy cost. And this is how the Model Y became the best selling car in the world last year. And yes, there are other electric cars out there, and this is the last thing I'll say about it, but the reason why I always talk as if only Tesla existed is because there are only two automakers with a profitable electric car business in the entire world, and those are Tesla and BYD, and I'm not even sure about BYD. Everyone else is economically unsustainable, so once you cut through the fluff, the market is a Tesla BYD duopoly. But anyway, electric cars, in order to measure their electricity consumption correctly, we have to look at them on an outlet to wheel basis. So not just battery to wheel, because charging the battery involves some losses. And when we do this, we find that they still use about 
five times less energy than combustion cars, so for every one kilowatt hour of solar electricity that an electric car uses, it saves about five kilowatt hours of oil. And the impact of this is going to be enormous, because oil for road transport is in many cases the biggest single component of energy consumption. And elephant number two is low temperature heat, or low heat for short. And this refers to heat that's under 200 degrees Celsius, which is actually most of the heat that we use. And while you can get electric heat by just using a resistive heater, that's not very efficient and the actual solution is heat pumps. So let's compare the energy profiles between the three solutions I've mentioned here. With a combustion boiler, you burn fuel that produces 1 kilowatt hour of primary heat, but only about 0.85 kilowatt hours of that heat gets captured and delivered as useful heat, while about 0.15 kilowatt hours gets lost with the flue gases. And with combustion heating, you are always going to have flue gases. With a resistive heater, however, it uses 1 kilowatt hour of electrical energy and produces exactly, precisely 1 kilowatt hour of heat from it, so it's slightly more efficient. But with a heat pump, you actually have a compressor which consumes 1 kilowatt hour of electrical energy and it uses this to power a mechanism which absorbs perhaps 4 kilowatt hours of heat from the outside air and releases those 4 kilowatt hours into whatever you're trying to heat, either water or directly into the inside air. If the amount of heat that gets pumped actually is 4 kilowatt hours, that would be called a coefficient of performance of 4, also known as COP, and the COP in practice can be anywhere between 3 and 6. Basically, heat pumps are ACs that run in reverse, and this can be used for everything from space heating, to hot water, to cheese making, to pasteurization, and if we're assuming the average COP of a heat pump to be about 3.5, and the average equivalent COP of a combustion boiler to be 0.85 and divide them, we find that a heat pump future powered by wind water solar is going to reduce the associated primary energy consumption by a factor of at least 4. And at this point, we've covered the majority of energy use. Road transport, low heat, and existing electricity consumption. A long tail of applications remains on the path to net zero, and they all do have net zero solutions, but all of them add up to relatively little, so I actually don't even need to address them to make my point in this video. So I'm gonna leave them untouched. But now this is the time to take everything we've discussed and see how it affects the energy consumption chart out to 2050. But I've already mentioned how these charts can be constructed in different ways, for instance by using the substitution method or by not using it. And for the purposes of this video, I'm actually going to make my own chart for 2022 in the European Union using the best data that I can find from multiple sources and measured in the correct way, and as a result we have this, energy consumption by source in 2022. The first step is to select the subset of each component which is used for existing electricity generation, so in this case it's a sliver of the oil, most of the coal, a good chunk of the gas, all of the nuclear, and half of the biomass. But I'm actually not going to select the biomass because I believe that we'll continue to use it for electricity even in a net zero future, so I'm just selecting the nuclear and the fossil fuels, and we convert these to wind and solar, each with their appropriate efficiency factors, and add all of the wind water solar into one category, and this is the first huge drop. Next up we have road transport, so we select the share of oil that's used for road transport, we switch that to electric vehicles, again assuming they're entirely powered by wind, water, solar, and this is how we get the second huge drop. And finally we select the subset of each category which is used for heating, so that's most of the remaining gas, some of the oil, and believe it or not, it's about half of the remaining coal, because there is actually a lot 
lot of coal heating in the European Union. And while the rest of the biomass is used for heating, I actually do not believe that the biomass will transition to heat pump, so I'm not going to be selecting it. But now we take our selection and divide it by 4 to get the equivalent for heat pumps with wind water solar, and this is our third and final huge drop. Now just to be fair, because I've transitioned everything to wind water solar, that's something that's going to require storage, which will mean some losses. So I'm going to add about 5% storage loss on top of the electricity consumption. And as I've said, I'm going to leave everything else untouched, not because it cannot go to net zero, but just because it's a long story that's not necessary to make my point. And as you can see, energy consumption will go down, that's my point, and the Henry Adams curve will become even further detached from reality. So there you go. I've made my argument for why the Henry Adams curve is wrong, but if you like and subscribe, I might make a video about why the Henry Adams curve is right. Thank you for watching, and make sure to let me know what you think about my current arguments in the comments. I read all your comments.